Hi, and welcome to this course on Intro to Game Development in Unreal Engine. In this tutorial, we are just going to be creating a mini game, and I'll be walking you through the steps. There's some notes you may want to take, and I have some slides that we'll also be going through to start. So here we go. The first thing is let's talk a little bit about the game development process. A lot of this you'll find your own way. And what's important to note about these, these steps is basically that they overlap. There's not necessarily a clean line between, you know, your concept and the requirements. You know, the concept can change, the requirements can change. You may start building the environment and then the requirements can change. You might have assets that affect the environment. It's never, these are more just guidelines, rough guidelines. It's not necessarily this, we do this and do this and then this and this. And then what we'll do is we're going to go through each one individually as we go through the game. So here we go. We're looking at here concept. So that's what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to talk about requirements. And then we're going to get into the actually building the game. So let's get this part of it going. So the concept, what is the concept? Well, the concept is basically, what is your idea for the game? What is your idea? And I like to think of it in filmmaking terms, in terms of an elevator pitch. It's like, let's say you got me in for one minute or two minutes. How can you explain the game as quickly as possible to me? In this case, I, I'm going to say that it's Doors of Death. This is a third person player obstacle course mini game. The player needs to get through a series of doors. If he touches a door, he dies. And he only has a certain amount of time to get through the doors, let's say 40 seconds. And if he doesn't, he also dies. If he doesn't make it and he dies, he's he's responds and can try again. And once he gets to the end of the course, when he gets to the end of the course, he gets a message that he's unlocked an achievement. In our case, it might be that he gets to go to another level. And also, this game, I wanted to have the functionality that the doors get more difficult to go through as he's making his way through the hallway or the corridor. So this is the concept. This is the concept, and then you map this out, and you got to be... It's kind of like your general roadmap. Then once you have the concept kind of fleshed out and you can explain it to people, then what you need to do, in filmmaking terms, this might be called a shot list, but it's basically, what are the requirements of the game? What what do we need to make this game work? You can think of it also as ingredients in a recipe. You must have these elements. So in this case, we have 13 things that need to happen. And they're not in any particular order of importance. Like number 12 is very important is we need a player character that can move through the scene. And we need a level to play on, a fully lit environment. We need textured materials, we need rotating doors, we need a menu system, we need the ability to respawn the player, we need the vi a visible timer on the menu, and basically in this tutorial we're going to create every single one of these things. These two on the 12 and 13 are actually done for us already, but it's very important for you to think about what you need for your game. And if you're trying to build a game for the very first time, what you might do is simply just work your way down each requirement. Like, if you don't know how to do something, you'd be that would be your challenge to figure out. And then once you've got that functionality worked out, then you can move on to the next one. So in other words, you might not even start building your game until you're sure that you can fulfill the requirements. So that's a very, this is where this is extremely helpful. So like, let's say you're trying to create a game that you're not even sure is possible, and then you list down all the requirements, and let's say, I don't know, let's say you don't know how to do step number nine. You don't know how to respond. Well, then that would be your quest, in a sense, to figure out how to do that. So you'd have to do research, go to the documentation, figure all that out. And then once you're to the point where you know you can fulfill all the requirements, then you could start building your game. It wouldn't make any sense to start building the game and not knowing if you could fulfill the requirements. Because you could build the whole game and then get to a point and say, oh, I can't, I don't even know how to do this, I don't even know how to do that. And maybe that would derail the whole thing. So this is just like your recipe or your shot list. That's very important to do. Now, for this particular game that we're going to be building, this is basically going to be the structure of it within Unreal Engine. We're going to model some assets for walls and a door. And then there'll be some surfaces that we're going to import. So that'll be here. This is our content browser. We're going to be creating a what's called a, basically a master template for the rotating doors. It's a blueprint. 
This will have the door rotation. Then we're going to create two triggers, a start trigger basically, when the player first enters the hallway, and this will start the timer and make the menu appear. Then we're going to make a stop timer when the player gets to the end of the hallway. We want to send a message to stop the timer and display the winning message. And this is what's already built for us already is this blueprint third person character. And this controls our player, the player's movement, and most of our game mechanics will be scripted inside here. And then there's a game mode. This comes built for us already too. And this basically sets the rules and governing structures for the game. And this is a game level, also known as a map. And it holds all these assets for us. And we can create multiple levels within the engine. In this case, we're just going to create one game level. And then we're going to have a very basic menu right here that's going to be called the Widget Blueprint Interface. So that's basically what our game's going to look like in Unreal Engine. So we have our concept. We've got our requirements. Now we're going to get started on building the game. So the first phase of that, and like I said, these don't necessarily follow in order. But the first phase of this is building our level or environment. And for this game, since we're using a game engine, we can take advantage of the fact that it already comes with pre-built, fully lit and configured levels ready to go. We're going to be using a basic level, and that's already created for us. And it's also going to be a persistent level, which means that none of our assets are going to be streamed in, and all the objects that we put in the game will stay in the game. In other levels, sometimes the objects or the actors can become unloaded, and we just don't even want to have to deal with that. And then, of course, you can create as many levels as you want within Unreal Engine. So this is what the, we're going to do right now, the very first step. So we're going to go into Unreal Engine right here, and we're going to go launch. And we're in 5.11 right now. Go launch. And it just takes a minute. This this particular phase of the process is very quick because these assets are already built for us. So when Unreal Engine runs, it's actually compiling the program in the background you can't see. It's actually running on C++, which is a low-level computer language, and it's very fast. And that's why it has so much pro data to process. You need a fast language to implement the program. So that downtime you see is actually the program compiling. Okay, so we're going to go into games, and we're going to go to third-person template right here. It's going to be in Blueprints, and we'll just leave it called My Project 2, and we'll go Create. And it just takes a minute for that to load in. Again, it needs to start up. It's going to start up another session, basically, loading all of our game elements and everything into the game. Of course, it take, varies in time how sometimes. And this is our person template. So here, you know, this is our content browser where all our files and folders are. This is our outliner that kind of shows everything that's in our scene. And a lot, there's a lot going on and it just takes practice. You'll get more familiar with it. So if I were to hit play right now, you'll see we've got a fully functional character running around able to jump. And we can, by using the mouse and the WASD keys, we can move around this environment. But if we come up here, if I hit escape to get out of the game, and I come up to window, you'll see world partition. If I click that, this this game, actually if I come into levels here, you'll see that the world partition is enabled. And this can create streaming. At some point, some of the assets that I create are actually going to be unloaded from this level. And so we don't want to deal with that. And not only that, there's a lot of assets in here that I don't want to just have to delete. So this this level has world partition enabled on it. I can actually go ahead and close this. And it's got a bunch of assets in here I don't want to have to deal with deleting. So it's just not it's not big enough. I don't really think it's big enough gameplay area either. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up into file and we're going to go create a new level. And we're going to create what's called a basic level, and we'll go create. Now, once this opens up, you can think of a level as a map of your, and it contains basically all the assets that we need for our game, and it will continue to hold all those assets. And this level, this is completely separate from the first level we were just in, but this is going to be our level that we're working in. So here we're on the content 
level right here of our browser and we're just going to go ahead file save current level as and we're just going to call this actually we can put it over here in our blueprints because this is where we're going to be doing most of our well there's a map in here there's our third person map so we can just go ahead and put our map in here and we're going to call this map level they're used interchangeably it basically just holds all of our assets for that level so i'm just going to call this main level and we won't actually need to come back here but that's where it'll be saved and actually what we're going to do is go into the third person the third person blueprint right here and this is where we're going to we double click this this is where we can dock this window up here on top and this is our player character so see there are the player characters right there there's a camera that follows the character wherever he goes and here are is basically a lot of built-in function already for the player's movement and all that we don't have to modify that but we will be doing some scripting in here and i'll explain more about that later so if i hit play there's our player character right there but now we're in this new le level so basically that's our first thing that we need to do and if you think about it we've already got a lot of the game already built because we have this beautiful world already built for us we got this ground plane to run around on and we have a fully functional character that we can follow around so that's fantastic but now we're going to go ahead and get started on building our game so the next step in our process is going to be creating um, assets or art creation so this would probably tie back into the requirements that we need we need a hallway if we go back here and look at some of what our requirements were we said we needed to have a corridor or a hallway to walk down and that we needed it textured with various materials and then we're going to need a rotating door and so we need all of this stuff we already have our player character now and a level so we've already got two of our requirements already done so if we come back in here on our our level let's get started with building those assets so basically what we're going to need if I come back in here and look at my assets we have this we're going to need two walls and a door and the walls will be built from a cube and modified to become walls the door will be created separately so we can replicate it we only need one door and then we'll be using what's called the quixel bridge and mega scans to surface our bare assets because otherwise they're going to, it's going to look pretty bland for our game so let's go ahead and do that right now so what we'll do is come over here to selection mode we'll go into modeling mode we're going to click on this cube and drag it and click now you notice our surface is set up in grids and we have over here in the corner these controls and this controls snapping so right now it's snapping in increments of 10 so each one of those little tiny squares is 10 units but we want it to snap in larger increments of that so we're going to adjust our snapping to units of 50 or we could even make it 100 so now when i drag this cube you'll see it's gonna it's being dragged well it's actually i actually don't like it doing in increments of 100 so let's do 50 on that so now if we drag this you'll see it's snapping onto the larger lines which is what we want now i know from experience how big i want this wall so i want i come over here to the shape and under width i can type 3000 hit tab the depth i want 10 and the height i want 800 oops 800 and these are just you can make your wall bigger or smaller depending on how you want and there is our wall so all i have to do now is accept and there is our wall now you'll notice there's these controls over here that we can use to rotate things but we also have this handy gizmo here so if you hit the space bar you can toggle between the different controls this is scaling we don't need to scale it this is moving we don't need to move it right now but we do want to rotate it so we use this tool and click here and we can drag it exactly 90 degrees so we have our wall then if i hit space bar a real handy shortcut probably the most handy shortcut of all time is if you hold down alt and click on one of these arrows you can actually duplicate whatever asset you're dragging on so i want to duplicate the wall 
and I want it to be approximately 200 units across here, which is almost the length of two of those big tiles. So just like that, if I click away from it, there is our hallway. So if I can come over here, you'll see those are some nice sized walls and we have this nice sized plane. So we'll be texturing this wall in just a minute, but we want to build also a door. So we'll come back onto our box. We'll double click and the wall is going to come in the shape of the door and that's fine. And we can go ahead and I know that we want the width to be 180 and the depth and height to stay the same. So there's our door. And so we'll go ahead and accept that. Now to position this, it was going to be quite difficult to do it from this perspective. So what we're going to do is switch our perspective to top. And then if I hit the scroll wheel, I can move out here. And then I here, I can click and drag this. And if I zoom in, I can really see what I'm doing here, how well I'm positioning this thing. And what I want to do here is actually change the snapping value back to five so that I have finer control over the asset. And I can see right there, it's perfectly spaced. So now if I switch back into perspective, you'll see there is our door asset. And that's all we needed for this. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to go ahead and texture this item because these are just grid material. You can see over here in the corner, it's a process grid material and it doesn't look that great. And I don't know if this has any material even on it. It does see, you'll see down here, it has no material. That's a completely blank wall. And while I'm on this, let's go ahead and rename these assets. And if you hit F, we'll just, instead of calling it box, we'll call it wall. And then box two, you hit F2 to rename it. We'll call this wall two. And box three is actually our door. So we'll hit F2 and call this door. So there we go. We've got our, basically our door of death that we're going to replicate. So let's go ahead and get started with texturing this. But before I do, I'd like to talk a little bit about UV mapping. And so UV mapping, it's really fascinating. At first time I ever heard this, I thought it was ultraviolet, <laughs> but it's not. And it's basically you take a, a 3D model that you've created and then you, what you basically call it is unwrapping it off of the sphere. So when you unwrap a, a sphere like this, it looks like this. And instead of calling these X and Y, for some reason they call them U and V. But because it's, it's basically taking a 3D, a texture on a 3D model in three coordinates and making it into two coordinates, X and Y. And this becomes our texture that we apply onto surfaces. So by nature, a UV map is flat and it comes in tiled. But what we can do is control the size of the tiles with these U and V values. So on the materials that we're gonna be using, we're gonna use corrugated metal sheet for the door, a dirty brick wall texture, and wild grass for the floor. In experimenting with this, I roughly got these values. We might adjust these as we go, but approximately if we retile the UV map with or texture with these values, it you won't see tiling. Because what happens is when you apply one of these textures, you can see it comes in in a square. And often it makes the environment look tiled with whatever surface that is. So we can minimize the appearance of the tiles themselves by adjusting the UV values. So that's an important concept to understand. So let's go ahead and jump back into Unreal and do that. So to do this, we're going to go into what's called the Quixel Bridge. And we, it's built into Unreal Engine now. We come up here and go Quixel Bridge. And hopefully it loads up. And then what we'll do is we can start searching for these assets. So I've already downloaded these before. So I'm one step ahead of you. So we'll search for wild grass. And it's right here. I've already downloaded it. To download it, you just simply click it and choose the quality that you want. Usually medium quality for a game like this is fine. Once it's downloaded, you'll see a green check mark, and then you just go down, add it to your game. And then it comes in over here. You'll see it over in your file directory over here. And then we're gonna search for another asset called Dirty Brick Wall. 
And there's other ones in here, like here it is right here. You can experiment with other textures if you want. I've already downloaded it. Double click it here. So you see it's green, so I've already downloaded it and I just click to add it. And then there's just one more. It's good to clear out your search bar here so because it filters your results. And the last one is corrugated metal sheet here. And I've got this dirty corrugated sheet. I've already downloaded it on medium quality and I'll just add it to my project. And you'll see all of these. Oops, I didn't double click this. So you have to see it here to be able to. Oh, that's not the one. This one there and add it to the project. You'll see it pop in over here to make sure that you've got it. Okay, and then once we have that, we're good to go. And you'll see that basically we can, if we right click, we can do what is, if we come to materials, we can create what's called a master material. And from that master, we can create instances of it. But we don't, these, that's already been built for us. So I'm gonna delete that actually. So these material instances, basically, that tells me that there's a master material somewhere out there and that we they're giving us access to modify this material. So what, that, what we gotta do is select the item that we wanna texture in the, in the environment. In this case, we wanna put the brick wall. We can do it one of two ways. We can drag it over here or drag it on right on here. On this. It's probably safer to do it this way. So we're just gonna drag this over there and you'll see the first problem with the tiling that comes in. So see how big those bricks are? That doesn't look realistic at all. So no bricks are that big. So what we have to do, I, can't, I think I said five and five. So if I double click into this material instance, and I don't really necessarily want it docked, I can come over here and under global, if I check this box, you'll see there's our option to retile this. So let's do five and five and see what that looks like and see that looks a lot more you can still see it looks tiled but if you're close in on it it doesn't look bad it doesn't look bad at all it looks like it's built in maybe sheets or something there's also a control on here called offset that would allow us to line these lines up better so if i double click here and i go to offset you'll see i can drag and line up the edges Again, to minimize the tiled look. You're still going to see it to some extent. And we can try experimenting. Let's see if we do seven and see what happens. Seven and seven. That makes it worse. So maybe we want maybe go the other direction. We'll go, let's do four and four. So just whatever you have to do, you can play around these values to kind of minimize. So maybe I need to adjust my, my offset a little bit more. And it may not be perfect, but it certainly looks better than, so that, I think that's good enough for that. And there we go. So we have our brick wall. These are fairly good sized bricks. And then what we can do is for the other wall, add that same material to this brick wall. So there, just like that, we've got our brick textured walls. Now we're going to add corrugated metal to the door, so we select the door in the scene. Come down here to corrugated metal, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to just drag this on. And of course that doesn't look right either. So again, we're going to double click into that material. Click here to adjust the tiling. You have to undock the windows usually so that you can see the results of the tiling. And I think, what do we do? 10 and 5? Yeah, so that's good. That looks pretty good right off the bat. So we'll leave that. And then the last one is just the grass. So we'll select the floor in the scene. We'll come to wild grass and we'll just drag that straight onto the, the ground. And that may be fine right there. You see the, the repetition of the tiling there. So on this one, we can actually make it very low. So let's just let's undock this here so we can see. And let's make this 0.5 and 0.5. And that makes the tiles bigger where it's much harder to see the, the tiling. And when your player is down here on the level, if I click play, you'll see we've got this nice surface now. And there's other things you can do to minimize the appearance of tiling. 
you know, those brick, those bricks could look, yeah, so they look like pretty darn big bricks, but it's not bad when you're down in the world, you really can't see the tiling too bad. And here, like on the door, you can't see it really, you can't see some of the tiling, but it looks pretty good. Okay, so then we have that all set. Now, the other thing we need to do is I hit escape to get out of the game. So now we're done and we can just go out of modeling mode. One thing that we want to do is bring in a player start. So notice right now I just spawn in kind of in this location. We want to have a little bit more control over that. So if I just hit escape and come over here on place actors and search for something called player start, I can drag this onto the scene. And this basically shows me where my player is going to come into the game. And I want to have control over that usually. Again, it's hard to see, get your perspective in here sometimes. So it's helpful to go in the top view here. And you can see the player start there. So maybe we want it to start right about there. Maybe over a little tiny bit more. And then if we go back into the game, into our main level. Well, we are in our main level. Let's change our perspective. And I hit play. Maybe I want it to be over just a little bit more. And maybe not such a jump, so I can bring this down. And there we go. So that's where I'm going to start at. Now, once the player start is selected, if we come down here, we want to make note of its values because we're going to need this in just a minute here, the location of where it spawned in. So it's going to be negative 2365, 450, and 122. And maybe we'll want it to spawn in at maybe negative 2400, 2450. Not quite where it spawned in, right where the player start is. Okay, so now we basically have got, we come back to our list and look at our requirements again. We have our quarter, we, we have our textured materials. Now we just need uh, rotating doors and some other other things to do. So we'll be getting each one of those done. But look, we've already got now four of the 13 requirements done. And as you'll see, we'll get through these pretty quick once we get going. Now the next thing we're going to create is the menu. And this is one of the most important aspects of the game because if you think about it, it's your only way of communicating with the player. And there's things that maybe you want the player to control, like through settings, Maybe there's certain buttons you want them to be able to press. It's basically defining how the character is going to interact with the game and how the game is going to communicate with the player. So it's important to get your menu designed early because it could actually influence other features that you're going to need or things maybe you didn't think of or improve the player experience in some way. So for this particular game, because this is just an introduction class, we're only going to have three text elements and a progress bar on our menu. So it's very, this is a very basic menu that we're going to create here. So we're going to jump back into Unreal Editor and we're going to go ahead and make our game. So like I said, we're going to do all of our coding here on the blueprint level here. So we'll keep all of our assets essentially on this level. And what I'm going to do is right click and I'm going to go to user interface, widget blueprint, user widget, and I'm gonna name this WBP menu. So I know what it is, but it's widget blueprint, and we'll double click into it right here. And this, like I said, is just a very basic menu, and this could be an entire seminar just understanding this whole system in here. But basically we need something called a canvas panel, which provides organizational structure Without this, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't be able to anchor any of our elements. So we drag this out to 1920 by 1080, which is the size of a computer monitor. So this game ultimately is designed for a Windows PC. And then all we need is four things. And one is text. And you can drag it onto the scene, or you can drag it down here and put it on the canvas panel. For this, I'm just going to drag this down here. And then we can come over here and anchor this in the lower right corner. So that'll just hold it in that position. We can size this to content. And then here, we're just going to write press ESC to quit game. 
and maybe I and then I'll hit compile and save maybe I don't need it taking up that much real estate on the screen so if we just come over to font and font size I can just change that to 12 because I just want it to be a little reminder message that the player does have that control if we were to publish this game if we didn't have some way to quit the game, there'd be no way to stop the game other than hitting your task, uh, control, alt, delete, and shutting the whole thing down. So you always want to think of how can I make this game stop? <laughs> then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to come on to text and drag that on here. And you'll see it comes in as a, a child. I can click on it here, up here, and drag it. And this is just going to be a message to our player basically saying what the game is about. So we're going to change the color here to red and we can do that just by zeroing out the green and blue values. We can size to content and we're just going to say you've got 40 seconds to get through the doors. And that's it. That's all that's going to say. And we'll kind of put it right there. And then there's just one more text we're going to do. We're going to get another text and drag it on the panel. Oh, for this I didn't anchor it. So we're going to anchor this in the lower center. And then this text block here, we're going to drag it over here. And we're going to go ahead and set its anchor in the upper right corner. Size to content. And this is simply just going to say time remaining. Like that, time remaining. And then we're going to go ahead and get a progress bar. So we'll go progress bar and drag this over here and place it under there. And there's a lot more you can do here. You can put the boxes inside of boxes and stuff like that. But this is just such a basic tutorial. And here's our percent. The reason why it's gray is because zero, if I click on the progress bar, zero is basically zero percent and one the number one represents a hundred percent and all the values between zero and one point zero one is one percent point zero two is two percent like that point four three is forty three percent so that's how it's represented here in unreal engine so that's the value one is the same as a hundred percent that's our user interface and we'll come back here to add some functionality to this at the end i want to go ahead i guess and anchor this in the right corner and this one I did anchor too, didn't I? Okay. So everybody's anchored down, and that's our basic user interface. And we're done there. So now we're going to move on to really the meat and potatoes of this whole process. And there's some things that we need to talk about before we get going. And this is really what I would call the game mechanics a logic. Basically, it's the heart of game development and is what ties everything together. And in Unreal Engine, there's two ways to do this. One is through writing code in a language called C++, which is very a whole can of worms on its own to learn. But that Unreal has also created its own language, visual scripting language called Blueprint Visual Scripting, that's a lot less complicated to learn and allows us to basically just hook wires and pins together and create game functionality. And with just a little practice, you'll see how relatively easy it is to learn. And most of the scripting we're going to do, it'll be in the Blueprint third person. But I've been using a couple terms here, and I wanted to go in a little bit more depth about them. And one is, you know, what exactly is a Blueprint? And I put some thought into this, but Unreal defines a Blueprint as an asset that allows content creators to easily add functionality on top of existing gameplay classes. Well, that that's a nice definition, but can we make it a little more general and specific at the same time. So really what it is, it's a reusable asset that contains a variety of data and functions that can be easily copied and customized in a game level. So you might just think of a blueprint as a collection of assets and functions and data that can be copied and reused. So at the most general level, that's what it is. But it's also important to make a distinction between blueprint visual scripting, which is the language we use to modify blueprints, and a blueprint, which is the actual reusable collection of assets. And for instance, in our game, we rely heavily on the blueprint third-person character, which not only contains our player and its movement, but also the other functions that we've built into it. We haven't built yet, but it's going to be the ability to die and respawn. And that's what's coming next. 
And so, but along with the blueprint, which are, they're very important for your game. It's, it's almost impossible to build a game without blueprints. I don't think you can actually build a game without blueprints. It relates to this other topic called blueprint communication. So let's say we've created these assets, uh, these collections of functions that we need to talk. They need to talk. So for our particular game, we're going to create a rotating door that needs to send a message to the player character. Hey, I've been touched, which means you need to kill the character. We need to a start trigger that needs to tell the the timer to start, and we need another we need another trigger to tell the blueprint to stop the timer. Because once the player gets to the end before the time is up, then we need to stop the timer. Otherwise, he would die inappropriately after he'd actually completed the game. So there's this always this need for blueprints to talk to each other. And there's different ways you can do it in Unreal. But one of the most common ways is by what they call direct blueprint communication. And it uses something called a casting node. There's other ways to do it other than casting, but casting is one method by which blueprints can directly communicate. So we're going to be using this at least four times in our game where we're going to be casting to our blueprint third person and then accessing one of its functions or a variable within this function. On a more technical level, basically what casting does is creates a reference to the blueprint. So we have its address, we know how, where it is and can communicate basically opening the channel of communication. Then we look to see if there's compatibility and that blueprint can kind of convert into the blueprint I'm in so they can talk to each other. Basically, are they speaking the same kind of language? And if so, then the direct communication can occur. And so hopefully this will become clearer as we go, but we'll be doing this a few times. But just know that casting is one way for blueprints to talk to each other. It's just one of the ways for them to talk. And with that said, we're going to go ahead and get started on making the majority of our game right now. So here we are. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into our blueprint third person character. And there's basically three functions that we need to create. We need to create a timer and a way to kill the character and have them respawn. So to do that, we're going to right click and create something that's called a custom event. We go add custom event right here. And we're going to name this. I'll zoom in here a little bit. If you didn't name it, you can name it up here or press F2 and name it. So we can just name it up here and call it die. And so what we need, we said that was one of our requirements. Again, going back to our game requirements, that's why this is so important. The character must visibly die what we call ragdoll, which is basically completely succumb and collapse to the effects of gravity. So that's what we call ragdoll. And to do that, there's basically three nodes that we need to do that. So the first one is we're going to drag off. And let's let me point out one thing here. If we click on our player character, the mesh is basically our, our character. So we want to control what happens to this mesh. Once we take control of it, we can make it collapse completely like an empty suit. So anyway, we want to set enable collision mesh here. And you notice how it's tied into the mesh. That's our target. And we want to set the physics to query and physics. Then we're going to want to simulate the effects of gravity. So we're going to go simulate physics on the mesh. And we have to check this box to simulate it. And then the last thing that we want to do is we have to blend, it's called blend weight. Set physics blend weight on our mesh. And this controls the d degree to which it collapses, so we'll just go one. And that'll basically ragdoll our character, those three nodes together. So what'll happen is the player character touches the door and the door is going to send a message over here. Hey, he touched it. He needs to die. Then this will be called and make the character completely collapse. And then when the character collapses, well, we don't want the body just laying there forever. So maybe, but we want it to be there for a little bit. So maybe we'll put a slight delay in there of like a second so that we can see that we are dead and have been killed. 
And then after that, now what we're going to do is this is the death part. Now we want to respawn our character. But before we can respawn our character, we got to get rid of the body. <laughs> we can't just have bodies piling up. So what we're going to do is drag off of here and get something called destroy actor. And this will get rid of the body. And the target is the self here, which is our third person character. Now, once the body has collapsed and been dis disappeared and destroyed, now we can respawn it. So we're going to drag off of here and search for something called spawn actor from class. And an actor is basically anything in the scene. Our class is our blueprint third person character. And our spawn, if we right click here, we can split this and it wants to know where do we want this to player to load back in. So what I'm going to do is just enter the values that I had just written down before, which is negative 2450. And these are the values from where our player start was. 450. And the last one is 130 approximately. And they don't have to be. And so that'll spawn us back just a little past where our player start is. And that's all we have to do there. And then ultimately under the engine behind the scenes, a an element called the player controller is ultimately controlling our rig. So we need the player controller. Once the actor has been destroyed, the player controller has kind of disconnected. So we need to reattach the player controller to our third person player character. So what we're going to do is we're going to search for that player controller, get player controller right here. And off of this, we can drag called possess. And this allows our player controller to take control again. And the pawn is what's controlled by the control, the player character. And what we want is that new, that brand new third person character we've just spawned in. We want that to be to controlled by the player controller. And then we'll just drag that there. And then the last thing, since we'll have a menu up on the screen, once the player's been killed, basically all bets are off, and then we want the game to start completely over, so we want to get rid of our menu. So one way to do that is we can create a reference to our menu over here, but another way to do that, a surefire way to do that, is if we just come in here and go create widget, this one right here, this will allow us to basically make a reference to the menu right here by doing this. And once we've made a, basically a reference to that menu, we can call what's removed from parent. And basically this is the same as like destroying the actor, but it basically, this basically right here gets rid, makes a connection to our menu and then gets it off the screen. And that's basically our die function. So our player will collapse, respawn, and the menu will disappear. And this will be called from the door and then we'll also call it within here once we get to build our time and timer function. So there's three more, actually there's three more functions we need to build now that I think about it. As I mentioned, we need an escape key so we can go keyboard press and we look for the escape key right here. And this is one of our requirements that we set. And off here, we're going to drag and search for something called quick game. So at any point that the player wishes to quit the game, they just have to hit the escape key, and that takes care of that right there. And the next thing is we're going to create a timer. So again, we're going to create a custom event, add custom event here, and we're going to name this start notify. And this is going to control our timer and ultimately our progress bar is going to be attached to a value that's in here. So we need to create a, what's called a variable to hold this ever changing value of the time coming from our time timer. So I'm just going to call this variable time and if right click here. We're going to set it to a float, which is basically a decimal value. It doesn't need to be public, so I can just compile and save this. And I can just drag this onto the scene and go set time. And then what we're going to do is we want, or this is going to have a trigger box that's going to send a message here saying, hey, the players at the beginning of the door, at the first door, start the game. 
So we want the menu to display and we want the timer to appear and the clock to start ticking basically. So what we're gonna do is make our menu appear. So again, we go create widget here and we're gonna tie this to our widget blueprint name right there. And then instead of remove from parent, which gets rid of it, we're going to add to viewport. And this is going to bring our menu into existence. Now, the next thing we're going to create is a timeline. So we're really, believe it or not, we're knocking out a lot of requirements right here. So if I go to add to timeline, oh, add timeline, just timeline. And we can leave it named timeline. We just double click into this and it's basically what it is. It's basically like a timer that changes one value in relationship to time going by. So that's all this is. So we'll go track, uh, float track. We're going to, so right now it's set for five seconds. We're gonna change it to 40. So come up here where it says length and type in 40. So we want this to be 40 seconds long. And then we want that value going from one to zero, the value decreasing from one to zero in decimals over 40 seconds. And this will control our progress bar and also our game logic. So we're gonna go add key, and the time is gonna be starting at zero. And the values, the starting value is gonna be one, which is basically 100%. Then we're gonna go ahead and click anywhere really on the timeline again. And the ending value time is going to be 40 seconds. And the value at 40 seconds is going to be zero. So we're going to start at zero seconds with the value of one and end at 40 seconds with the value of zero. And if we click here and here, whoops, if I click here and here, we can see the whole timeline basically decreasing from one to zero over 40 seconds. And this is what's going to control our progress bar. So we can compile and save that and go back into our event graph now. So then all we have to do is to start the clock is this is our program flow right here. We're just gonna plug that into player start. And here is our time coming out here. So all we gotta do is the one going to zero, we'll plug that into there. Even though it says time, it's really the percentage value. And the update goes into here. So this value will continually update as we go along. So I guess it is confusing that I called it time, but it's really the percent value going from one to zero. But you can think of it as time going by two. So now the next thing we wanna do is one of our requirements for the game is that we want the player to die if they run out of time. So they've got 40 seconds basically right now, but if the, the time value gets to zero, we want the player to die. So that's the next functionality we're gonna put in here. So to do that, we're gonna press B on the keyboard and click, and this is gonna create a branch node which can be based on a condition. And the condition is, well, we're gonna get our time and drag off of here and goes, go equal. And so if our time equals zero, gets to zero, that's our condition. If that becomes true, that time is zero, then we want our player to die because that means they didn't get to the end before the 40 seconds. And how do we make them die? Well, we have the die function right here. All we have to do is call it to activate. So to call it to activate, we just drag off of here and go call die. And now this will call our die, our, in other words, our player will die if our time value gets to zero. And then the only other function that we got to do is we've got to create a, a stop the timer. So if the player does get to the end of the doors and there's still time on the clock, then we want to stop the timer because they've won basically. So all we have to do for that is right click. We're going to add a custom function again. And we're just going to call this stop timer. And all we, this is the easiest one of all, all we have to do is plug this in to stop. And that basically concludes a, quite a bit of our requirements right here. We've got our escape key over here. We've got our death and respawn event. We've got our timer going here. 
and then we've got if the time runs out for them to die. So we've knocked out a lot of requirements just with this one line of code. So now what we can do, since we're done with this, is this value here, we want to tie it to our progress bar. So if I come over to our progress bar, what I have to do for the blueprint communication to occur is there has to be a reference to the other blueprint. That's one of the requirements for blueprint communication to occur. So if we go into graph here off of this event construct node, what we can do is just cast to BP third person and make that reference. So here it's going to be, this, the object is our player character, so we're going to right click and get, so we'll be doing this several times here, get player character, actually three more times. This goes in here. And then all we want is a, to create a reference to this blueprint. So we right click here and just go promote to variable, and that creates a reference to our once that reference is created, then we can access any variables or data or functions inside that blueprint. So if I go back into designer here, I click on the progress bar and on where the percent value is, which is our time value, and I go bind as blueprint third person character, I just select time. And now this ties this progress bar to our time variable, which will be changing in relationship to this. So this is what's gonna cause our progress bar to go down in time. So now we're really on the home stretch. We just need to make our triggers and we need to make our winning message and we need to make our rotating doors of all things. That's what we need to do. So let's go ahead and make our rotating door. We're going to click on this door right here. If we come over into this button, we can take this object here and bring it into a blueprint. So we're going to go new subclass static mesh actor and I'm going to call this BP door and I'm going to select that and then it pops us into this blueprint and you can see there's our door now we need to create something that's called a box collision so that we know if the player were to bump in this right now there'd be no way for it to trigger anything because it's just a static mesh but if we come over here and go box collision this one right here it comes into the scene right there and if we come over here on these controls, we can start scaling it. We should be able to hit the space bar. Oops. Should be able to hit the space bar here and just scale it up like this. And hit the space bar, I can reposition it too. Now, when you're doing this, you want to make sure that you don't overscale this object because if we scaled it too far out, the player could be hitting it even before they're close to it. So you want to get it as close to the surface as we can but not overly close so I think right there is pretty good can I take it in anymore oh, that's about it okay and then I can I don't want it touching anything else so there we have our box collider attached to our door we can compile and save that now we want to tell with the box collider selected we want to come down, scroll down here on the right side and go on event begin overlap. So now what we want is we want to be able to call our die function in our blueprint third person over here. We want to be able to call this function. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do it the same way, which is through casting. So we're going to go cast to BP third person right here. And we're going to get our player character right there and now that we've created this reference to our blueprint all we need to do is drag off of here and go call die and that's all we have to do so if the player touches the door it'll send a message for the player to die and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make we need to make of course our doors rotate so we don't need these up here and we have our event tick right here. And an event tick basically fires every frame. And a delta seconds, though, is what we're going to be using because delta seconds fire uh, is the time since the last frame rendered. So it's basically frame rate independent. 
So it's better to drive this ro door rotation off of delta seconds because then the doors will always spin the same rate no matter the frame rate being the game is being played. An event tick fires per frame rate. So if it's your game is running 30 frames per second, then it's firing 30. If it's 50, 60, it's going to be 60 frames per second. So we just want it to be consistent. So we delta seconds is basically frame rate independent. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we need to create a variable to control this. So what we're going to do is create what I call spin factor. And this is going to be a float value here. And it needs to be what they call instance editable or public. And if we don't set this value over here to at least 50, it's going to be zero times a second, so which is going to be zero and the door won't rotate. So there needs to be a value here. And so drag this onto the scene, get it. And then we're going to right click and go multiply. So we're going to multiply this by our delta seconds. So this goes in here and this goes in here. And then there's a built-in function called actually make rotator. It makes it very easy to make things rotate. And we want this to rotate on the yaw. And then the only other thing we gotta do is search for a node called add local rotation for the static mesh component. And all we have to do is plug this into there and then wire up this pin right here. And that'll basically make our door rotate. So if we were to go into the game right now and hit play, the door should be rotating. So we're, you can see how fast we're, we've come, right, in a relatively short amount of time. So now we want to make multiple doors. Since we're on the door, we can go ahead and make multiple copies of the door. This is so easy to do. And if we're clicked on the door, you see here's the spin factor. So the higher this number is, the faster the door is going to spin. And if I put a negative in front of this value, the door will spin the other direction. So this is how we can customize the rate at which our doors are spinning. So what we're going to do for this is just come into the top view here and zoom down here. If I hold down the Alt key and drag, I can make a copy of the door. That's simple. And we're just going to make this four doors. So Alt again and drag, Alt again and drag, holding down Alt. And this is our last door here. And then we're done. I can go back into perspective view. And with that last door selected, I could change the value here to be like 150. So it's spinning pretty fast. Up here in the outliner, I can select the door and make it negative 100. So it's spinning the other direction. This door, I can make the value here 80. And then this door here, maybe I'll make it negative 75. So then we have a variety of doors spinning and it gets more and more as it goes. So if we jump back real quick and look at our game, our game requirements, you can see we've come a long way with what the door, what we're able to do. We have the quarter, the rotating doors, the character's going to die if he touches a door, the timer, the quit the game, a message when the game's completed. We don't have that yet. We need a visible timer on the menu. We do. Player needs to respond if killed. The quit game function. Yeah, we pretty much have everything except just our triggers right now. So we're really on the home stretch. So now we're going to make two triggers. And we're going to put one trigger here at the front entrance and one at the back. And the one is going to start the game and the other one is going to end the game. And when the game starts, we want the the timer to start and the menu to display. So we're going to put a box trigger right here. At the end, we want to stop the timer and create uh, display a winning message. And that's basically all the functionality we have left to do. So to do this, we're just going to right click, go to blueprint class, actor, and we're just going to call this BP underscore start notify. And I'm going to double click into it. And I'm going to get add a box collider here, a box trigger. Double click it, it's right there. We can thicken up the lines here. Since we're going to be seeing it in the game, we want it to be easy to see. And that's all we have to do there. Then all we have to do is on the event graph, if we can, no, we'll come here down to box 
and it's a trigger. So as soon as a player overlaps it, we want things to trigger. And again, we're going to cast, do casting. You see the pattern, cast to BP third person. This creates an object reference to our player character. Get player character. There we go with that. And now that we have that reference, all we have to do is we can drag off of here and we want to go call start notify. So this will start our display our menu. If we come back in here, we're calling this, it's going to display the menu and start the timer clicking. Okay. So that's all we have to do for the start notify. That's a very simple one to do. Then what we can do, and this goes back to the reusability of everything. If we simply right click on this and go duplicate and call this BP underscore stop timer, we don't have to even rewrite that code we just wrote. So here, instead of calling to start, we want to call to stop. So we're going to stop timer. Now we also want to display a winning message. So one way to do that relatively easy is if we come into the viewport here and we go add, we can add what's called a text renderer and just double click it. And we can just drag this up here and over here on the details panel, we can set to center. We can change the, the font color here to black. And then I just know from having done this before, I'm just going to click here. The text is going to say just level completed or, you know, whatever you wanted it to say. So we'll go level completed. And then I know that this arrow is going to have to be facing. We can, we can do this a couple ways, but the easiest way is we're going to have to probably rotate this in the game. So we're just going to drag this out like that, maybe to there and maybe up just a little bit like that and that should be that should be good so we'll compile and save that so now all we need to do is just set these triggers into the game so we're going to get our start notify and drag it down here and let, if we hit f we can zoom down and we can just place it right there you can't it, the door cannot hit hit this because it's going to trigger so we don't really want the door to hit it. So move it out a little ways here. Should be clear from the door. Hit the space bar and then we can scale this up so that you know it's sure to get hit. And then we can come into the top perspective, zoom in here a little bit and make sure that we're getting it to the size that we want. And it may be that if you don't want this trigger openly exposed, we could just make this a door that opens and have the trigger in here, but this should be fine for what we're trying to do. We just don't want the door to hit that trigger and that players should be able to trigger that. Okay. And we'll go back into perspective view. I think that's a good spot. We could scale this up, you know, so we're sure that the player one way or another is going to hit it. But that's our box trigger. Okay. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to place our other trigger down here. So we're going to get our box timer and put it right here. And you can see our message displaying right there, right? So we want it to, we hit rotate and we want to spin this around. Level completed. That looks like a good spot for it. And then we can just scoot this in, just inside there a little bit. Right, that should be good. We can go to this side here a little bit and put that there. And let's go ahead and scale this up a little bit so we know the player's short to hit it, hit our box, trigger there. And that should be it. That should pretty much be it. Now, the only thing we need to do is right now, if I hit play, what's interesting is I can go around the back. And we can see this message displaying. So if I come through the level, I'll see it right there. Right? So that's fine. But 
we don't want to see it until we've actually completed the level. So what we have to do is escape, come into our BP stop timer here, and we're going to go into the event graph here. And what we're going to do is grab our text renderer. And what we want to do is over here, we search for its visibility. So what we're going to do is turn it off so we can't see it. You've got to have, to have it selected. So we won't be able to see it at all now because we turned its visibility off. But then if the player crosses the threshold and hits the trigger, then we want to set the visibility back on. So then the message comes on. So then we'll click that and go new visibility. And that way when we play the game, we won't see our winning message. And we shouldn't see our winning message until we cross the threshold. And believe it or not, that's pretty much everything. So now we've got all of our requirements done and we're moving into the last phase, which is basically, if we come to our message here, is the testing and the tweaking. So let's play our game and see if there's any errors. Let's see if there's anything. So we hit play. There is our game. There are our menu displays. You see our timer running down. There's our message. We've got 40 seconds. Press escape to quit the game. I come over here. Let's just test and see if I die when the time runs out. So there is so much application for once you have this level of knowledge, so easy to start adding all different kinds of things. And like I said, a good way to start is just by coming up with your concept, writing down what the required features are, and then just knocking out the requirements one by one, especially if it's something more complicated and you don't know how to do it, or you're not sure how to do it. Then once you've got kind of your ingredients all together, see, <laughs> okay. So now let's just try to get through the doors. And that is the game, right? Star one. This is a little tricky. So that one. You can see where if I made that box collider too thick, it, I would I would might clip it somehow. Which would make the game virtually impossible to do. See how the doors are spinning faster now? You might have to get a running start on some of these doors. And then the very last door. Oh, look at the time, too. Oh, I didn't make it. <laughs> That's the game. I could actually test this functionality back here just by coming around the back. <laughs> this one, Because this will stop the timer. And I get my message. So it all seems to work. Anyway, I hope you found this helpful, and please consider subscribing if you found this helpful. A lot of time went into developing this tutorial, and this just, when you subscribe, it kind of tells me I'm on the right track. Okay, take care, and I'll talk to you next time.